The Song of Achilles, Chapter 9 The next morning I woke to the soft sounds of Chiron getting breakfast ready. The pallet was thick beneath me. I had slept well and deeply. I stretched, startling a little when my limbs bumped against Achilles, still asleep beside me. I watched him a moment, rosy cheeks and steady breaths. Something tugged at me, just beneath my skin, but then Chiron lifted a hand in greeting from across the cave, and I lifted one shyly in return, and it was forgotten. That day after we ate, we joined Chiron for his chores. It was easy, pleasurable work, collecting berries, catching fish for dinner, setting quail snares. The beginning of our studies, if it is possible to call them that, for Chiron liked to teach, not in set lessons, but in opportunities. When the goats that wandered the ridges took ill, we learned how to mix purgatives for their bad stomachs, and when they were well again, how to make a polis that repelled their ticks. When I fell down a ravine, fracturing my arm and tearing open my knee, we learned how to set splints, clean wounds, and what herbs to give against infection. On a hunting trip, after we had accidentally flushed a corncrake from its nest, he taught us how to move silently and how to read the scuffles of tracks, and when we had found the animal, the best way to aim a bow or sling so that death was quick. If we were thirsty and had no water skin, he would teach us about the plants whose roots carried beads of moisture. When a mountain ash fell, we learned carpentry, splitting off the bark, sanding and shaping the wood that was left. I made an axe handle, and Achilles the shaft of a spear. Chiron said that soon we would learn to forge the blades for such things. Every morning and every evening, we helped with meals, churning the thick goat's milk for yogurt and cheese, gutting fish. It was work we had never been allowed to do before, as princes, and we fell upon it eagerly. Following Chiron's instructions, we watched in amazement as butter formed before our eyes, at the way Fezneg sizzled and solidified on fire-warmed rocks. After a month over breakfast, Chiron asked us what else we wished to learn. Those. I pointed to the instruments on the wall. For surgery, he had said. He took them down for us, one by one. Careful. The blade is very sharp. It is for when there is rot in the flesh that must be cut. Press the skin around the wound, and you will hear a crackle. Then he had us trace the bones in our own bodies, running a hand over the ridging vertebrae of each other's backs. He pointed with his fingers, teaching the places beneath the skin where the organs lodged. A wound in any of them will eventually be fatal, but death is quickest here. His finger tapped the slight concavity of Achilles' temple. A chill went through me to see it touched, that place where Achilles' life was so slenderly protected. I was glad when we spoke of other things. At night we lay on the soft grass in front of the cave, and Chiron showed us the constellations, telling their stories, Andromeda cowing before the sea monster's jaws, and Perseus poised to rescue her. The immortal horse Pegasus, aloft on wings borne from the severed neck of Medusa. He told us, too, of Heracles, his labors and the madness that took him. In its grip he had not recognized his wife and children and had killed them for enemies. Achilles asked, How could he not recognize his wife? That is the nature of madness, Chiron said. His voice sounded deeper than usual. He had known this man, I remembered. He had known the wife. But why did the madness come? The gods wished to punish him, Chiron answered. Achilles shook his head impatiently. But this was a greater punishment for her. It was not fair of them. There is no law that gods must be fair, Achilles, Chiron said. And perhaps it is the greater grief, after all, to be left on earth when another is gone, do you think? Perhaps, Achilles admitted. I listened and did not speak. Achilles' eyes were bright in the firelight, his face drawn sharply by the flickering shadows. I would know it in darker disguise, I told myself. I would know it, even in madness. Come, said Chiron. Have I told you the legend of Aesculapius and how he came to know the secrets of healing? He had, but we wanted to hear it again, the story of how the hero, son of Apollo, had spared a snake's life. The snake had licked his ears clean in gratitude so that he might hear her whisper the secrets of herbs to him. 
But you were really the one that taught him healing, Achilles said. I was. You do not mind the snake gets all the credit? Chiron's teeth showed through his dark beard, a smile. No, Achilles, I do not mind. Later Achilles would play the lyre as Chiron and I listened. My mother's lyre. He had brought it with him. I wish I had known, I said the first day when he had showed it to me. I almost did not come because I did not want to leave it. He smiled. Now I know how to make you follow me everywhere. The sun sank below Pelion's ridges, and we were happy. Time passed quickly on Mount Pelion, days slipping by and idle. Mountain air was cold now in the mornings when we woke, and warmed only reluctantly in the thin sunlight that filtered through the dying leaves. Chiron gave us furs to wear and hung animal skins from the cave's entrance to keep the warmth in. During the days we collected wood for winter fires or salted meat for preserving. The animals had not yet gone into their dens, but they would soon, Chiron said. In the mornings we marveled at the frost-etched leaves. We knew of snow from bards and stories. We had never seen it. One morning I woke to find Chiron gone. This was not unusual. He often rose before we did, to milk the goats or pick fruits for breakfast. I left the cave so that Achilles might sleep and sat to wait for Chiron in the clearing. The ashes of last night's fire were white and cold. I stirred them idly with a stick, listening to the woods around me. A quail muttered in the underbrush, and a morning dove called. I heard the rustle of ground cover from the wind or an animal's careless weight. In a moment, I would get more wood and rekindle the fire. The strangeness began as a prickling of my skin. First the quail went silent, then the dove. The leaves stilled and the breeze died, and no animals moved in the brush. There was a quality to the silence, like a held breath, like the rabbit beneath the hawk's shadow. I could feel my pulse striking my skin. Sometimes I reminded myself, Chiron did small magics, tricks of divinity like warming water or calming animals. Chiron? I called. My voice wavered thinly. Chiron? It is not Chiron. I turned. Thetis stood at the edge of the clearing, her bone-white skin and black hair bright as slashes of lightning. The dress she wore clung close to her body and shimmered like fish scale. My breath died in my throat. You are not to be here, she said, a scrape of jagged rocks against a ship's hull. She stepped forward and the grass seemed to wilt beneath her feet. She was a sea nymph, and the things of earth did not love her. I'm sorry, I managed, my voice a dried leaf rattling my throat. I warned you, she said. The black of her eyes seemed to seep into me, fill my throat to choking. I could not have cried out if I dared to. A noise behind me, and then Chiron's voice, loud in the quiet. Greetings, Thetis. Warmth surged back into my skin, and breath returned. I almost ran to him, but her gaze held me there, unwavering. I did not doubt she could reach me if she wished. You're frightening the boy, Chiron said. He does not belong here, she said. Her lips were red as newly spilled blood. Chiron's hand landed firmly on my shoulder. Patroclus, he said. You will return to the cave now. I will speak with you later. I stood unsteadily and obeyed. You have lived too long with mortal centaur. I heard her say before the animal skins closed behind me. I sagged against the cave's wall. My throat tasted brackish and raw. Achilles? I said. His eyes opened and he was beside me before I could speak again. Are you all right? Your mother is here, I said. I saw the tightening of muscle beneath his skin. She did not hurt you. I shook my head. I did not add that I thought she wanted to, that she might have if Chiron had not come. I must go, he said. The skins whispered against each other as they parted for him, then slipped shut again. I could not hear what was said in the clearing, 
Their voices were low, or perhaps they had gone to speak elsewhere. I waited, tracing spirals in the packed earth floor. I did not worry any longer for myself. Chiron meant to keep me, and he was older than she was, full-grown when the gods still rocked in their cradles, when she had been only an egg in the womb of the sea. But there was something else, less easy to name. A loss, or lessening, that I feared her presence might bring. It was almost midday when they returned. My gaze went to Achilles' face first, searching his eyes, the set of his mouth. I saw nothing but perhaps a touch of tiredness. He threw himself onto the pallet beside me. I'm hungry, he said. As well you should be, Chiron said. It is much past lunch. He was already preparing food for us, maneuvering in the cave space easily despite his bulk. Achilles turned to me. It is all right, he said. She just wanted to speak to me, to see me. She will come speak with him again, Chiron said. As if he knew what I thought, he added. As is proper, she is his mother. She is a goddess first, I thought. Yet as we ate, my fears eased. I had half worried she might have told Chiron of the day by the beach, but he was no different towards either of us, and Achilles was the same as he always was. I went to bed, if not at peace, at least reassured. She came more often after that day, as Chiron had said she would. I learned to listen for it, a silence that dropped like a curtain, and knew to stay close to Chiron then, in the cave. The intrusion was not much, and I told myself I did not begrudge her, but I was always glad when she was gone again. Winter came, and the river froze. Achilles and I ventured onto it, feet slipping. Later, we cut circles from it and dropped lines for fishing. It was the only fresh meat we had. The forests were empty of all but mice and the occasional marten. Snows came, as Chiron had promised they would. We lay on the ground and let the flakes cover us, blowing them with our breath until they melted. We had no boots nor cloaks other than Chiron's furs, and were glad of the cave's warmth. Even Chiron donned a shaggy overshirt, sewed from what he had said was a bearskin. We counted the days after the first snowfall, marking them off with lines on a stone. When you reach fifty, Chiron said, the river's ice will begin to crack. The morning of the fiftieth day we heard it, a strange sound like a tree falling. A seam had split the frozen surface nearly from bank to bank. Spring will come soon now, Chiron said. It was not long after that the grass began to grow again, and the squirrels emerged lean and whipped thin from their burrows. We followed them, eating our breakfast in the new scrub spring air. It was on one of these mornings that Achilles asked Chiron if he would teach us to fight. I do not know what made him think of this then, a winter indoors with not enough exercise perhaps, or the visit from his mother the week before. Perhaps neither. Will you teach us to fight? There was a pause so brief I almost might have imagined it before Chiron answered, If you wish it. I will teach you. Later that day, he took us to a clearing high on a ridge. He had spear halves and two practice swords for us, taken from storage in some corner of the cave. He asked us each to perform the drills that we knew. I did slowly, the blocks and strikes and footwork I had learned in Pythia. To my side, just at the corner of my vision, Achilles' limbs blurred and struck. Chiron had brought a bronze-banded staff, and he interposed it occasionally into our passes, probing with it testing our reactions. It seemed to go on for a long time, and my arms grew sore with lifting and placing the point of the sword. At last, Chiron called a stop. We drank deep from our water skins and lay back on the grass. My chest was heaving. Achilles was steady. Chiron was silent, standing in front of us. Well, what do you think? Achilles was eager, and I remember that Chiron was only the fourth person to have ever seen him fight. I did not know what I expected the centaur to say but it was not what followed. There's nothing I can teach you. You know all that Heracles knew and more. You are the greatest warrior of your generation, and all the generations before. A flush stained Achilles' cheeks. I could not tell if it was embarrassment or pleasure or both. Men will hear of your skill, and they will wish for you to fight their wars. He paused. 
What will you answer? I do not know, Achilles said. That is an answer for now. It will not be good enough later, Chiron said. There was a silence then, and I felt the tightness in the air around us. Achilles' face for the first time since we had come looked pinched and solemn. What about me? I asked. Chiron's dark eyes moved to rest on mine. You will never gain fame from your fighting. Is this surprising to you? His tone was matter-of-fact, and somehow that eased the sting of it. No, I said truthfully. Yet it is not beyond you to be a competent soldier. Do you wish to learn this? I thought of the boy's dulled eyes, how quickly his blood had soaked the ground. I thought of Achilles, the greatest warrior of his generation. I thought of Thetis, who would take him from me if she could. No, I said. And that was the end of our lessons in soldiery. Spring passed into summer, and the woods grew warm and abundant, lush with game and fruit. Achilles turned fourteen, and messengers brought gifts for him from Peleus. It was strange to see them here, in their uniforms and palace colors. I watched their eyes flickering over me, over Achilles, over Chiron most of all. Gossip was dear in the palace, and these men would be received like kings when they returned. I was glad to see them shoulder their empty trunks and be gone. The gifts were welcome. New lyre strings and fresh tunics, spun from the finest wool. There was a new bow as well, and arrows tipped with iron. We fingered their metal, the keen-edged points that would bring down our dinners in days to come. Some things were less useful. Cloaks thick with inlaid gold that would give the owner's presence away at fifty paces, and a jewel-studded belt, too heavy to wear for anything practical. There was a horse coat as well, thickly embroidered, meant to adorn the mount of a prince. I hope that is not for me, Chiron said, lifting an eyebrow. We tore it up for compresses and bandages and scrub cloths. The rough material was perfect for pulling up crusted dirt and food. That afternoon, we lay on the grass in front of the cave. It has been almost a year since we came, Achilles said. The breeze was cool against our skin. It does not feel so long, I answered. I was half sleepy, my eyes lost in the tilting blue of the afternoon sky. Do you miss the palace? I thought of his father's gifts, the servants and their gazes, the whispering gossip they would bring back to the palace. No, I said. I don't either, he said. I thought I might, but I don't. The days turned, and the months, and two years passed. Chapter 10 It was spring, and we were fifteen. The winter ice had lasted longer than usual, and we were glad to be outside once more beneath the sun. Our tunics were discarded, and our skin prickled in the light breeze. I had not been so naked all winter. It had been too cold to take off our furs and cloaks beyond quick washes in the hollowed-out rock that served as our bath. Achilles was stretching rolling limbs that were stiff from too long indoors. We had spent the morning swimming and chasing game through the forest. My muscles felt wearily content, glad to be used again. I watched him. Other than the unsteady surface of the river, there were no mirrors on Mount Pelion, so I could only measure myself by the changes in Achilles. His limbs were still slender, but I could see the muscles in them now, rising and falling beneath his skin as he moved. His face, too, was firmer, and his shoulders broader than they had been. "'You look older,' I said. He stopped and turned to me. "'I do?' "'Yes,' I nodded. "'Do I?' "'Come over here,' he said. I stood, walked to him. He regarded me a moment. "'Yes,' he said. "'How?' I wanted to know. "'A lot?' Your face is different, he said. Where? He touched my jaw with his right hand and drew his fingertips along it. Here. Your face is wider than it once was. I reached up with my own hand to see if I could feel this difference, but it was all the same to me, bone and skin. He took my hand and brought it down to my collarbone. 
You are wider here also, he said. And this? His finger touched gently, a soft bulb that emerged from my throat. I swallowed and felt his fingertip ride against the motion. Where else? I asked. He pointed to the trail of fine dark hair that ran down my chest and over my stomach. He paused and my face grew warm. That's enough, I said more abruptly than I meant to. I sat again on the grass and he resumed his stretches. I watched the breeze stir his hair. I watched the sun fall on his golden skin. I leaned back and I let it fall on me as well. After some time, he stopped and came to sit beside me. He watched the grass and the trees and the nubs of new buds just growing. His voice was remote, almost careless. You would not be displeased, I think, with how you look. My face grew warm again, but we spoke no more of it. We were almost sixteen. Soon Peleus's messengers would come with gifts. Soon the berries would ripen, the fruits would blush and fall into our hands. Sixteen was our last year of childhood, the year before our fathers named us men, and we would begin to wear not just tunics, but capes and chittens as well. A marriage would be arranged for Achilles, and I might take a wife if I wished to. I thought again of the serving girls with their dull eyes. I remembered the snatches of conversation I had overheard from the boys, the talk of breasts and hips and coupling. She's like cream, she's that soft. Once her thighs are around you, you'll forget your own name. The boys' voices had been sharp with excitement, their color high, but when I tried to imagine what they spoke of, my mind slid away like a fish who would not be caught. Other images came in their stead. The curve of a neck bent over a lyre, hair gleaming in firelight, hands with their flickering tendons. We were together all day, and I could not escape. The smell of the oils he used on his feet, the glimpses of skin as he dressed. I would retch my gaze from him and remember the day on the beach, the coldness in his eyes and how he ran from me. And always, I remembered his mother. I began to go off by myself early in the mornings, when Achilles still slept, or in the afternoons when he would practice his spear thrust. I brought a flute with me, but rarely played it. Instead, I would find a tree to lean against and breathe the sharp drift of cypress scent blown from the highest part of the mountain. Slowly, as if to escape my own notice, my hand would move to rest between my thighs. There was a shame in this thing that I did, and a greater shame still in the thoughts that came with it, but it would be worse to think them inside the rose quartz cave with him beside me. It was difficult sometimes, after, to return to the cave. Where were you? He'd ask. Just... I'd say, and point vaguely. He'd nod, but I knew he saw the flush that colored my cheeks. The summer grew hotter, and we sought the river's shade, its water that threw off arcs of light as we splashed and dove. The rocks at the bottom were mossy and cool, rolling beneath my toes as I waded. We shouted and frightened the fish, who fled into their muddy holes or quieter waters upstream. The rushing ice melt of spring was gone, I lay on my back and I let the dozy current carry me. I liked the feel of the sun on my stomach and the cool depths of the river beneath me. Achilles floated beside me, or swam against the slow tug of the river's flow. When we tired of this, we would seize the low-hanging branches of the oceans and hoist ourselves half out of the water. On this day we kicked at each other, our legs tangling, trying to dislodge the other, or perhaps climb onto their branch. On an impulse, I reached my branch and seized him around his hanging torso. He let out an oomph of surprise. We struggled that way for a moment, laughing, my arms wrapped around him. Then there was a sharp cracking sound, and his branch gave way, plunging us into the river. The cool water closed over us, and still we wrestled, hands against slippery skin. When we surfaced, we were panting and eager. He leapt from me, bearing me down through the clear water. We grappled, emerged to gasp air, and then sank again. At length, our lungs burning, our faces red from too long under water, we dragged ourselves to the bank and lay there, amidst the sedge grass and marshy weeds. Our feet sank into the cool mud of the water's edge. Water still streamed from his hair, and I watched it bead tracing across his arms and lines of his chest. On the morning of his sixteenth birthday, I woke early. 
Chiron had showed me a tree on Pelion's far slope that had figs just ripening, the first of the season. Achilles did not know of it, the centaur assured me. I watched them for days, their hard green knots swelling and darkening, growing gravid with seed, and now I would pick them for his breakfast. It wasn't my only gift. I had found a seasoned piece of ash and began to fashion it secretly, carving off its soft layers. Over nearly two months a shape had emerged, a boy playing the lyre, head raised to the sky, mouth open, as if he were singing. I had it with me now as I walked. The figs hung rich and heavy on the tree, their curved flesh pliant to my touch. Two days later and they would be too ripe. I gathered them in a carved wood bowl and bore them carefully back to the cave. Achilles was sitting in the clearing with Chiron, a new box from Peleus resting unopened at his feet. I saw the quick widening of his eyes as he took in the figs. He was on his feet, eagerly reaching into the bowl before I could even set it down beside him. We ate until we were stuffed, our fingers and chins sticky with sweetness. The box from Peleus held more tunics and lyre strings, and this time, for his sixteenth birthday, a cloak dyed with the expensive purple from the Murex's shell. It was the cape of a prince, of a future king, and I saw that it pleased him. It would look good on him, I knew, the purple seeming richer beside the gold of his hair. Chiron, too, gave presents, a staff for hiking and a new belt knife, and last I passed him the statue. He examined it, his fingertips moving over the small marks my knife had left behind. It's you, I said, grinning foolishly. He looked up, and there was bright pleasure in his eyes. I know, he said. One evening, not long after, we stayed late beside the fire's embers. Achilles had been gone for much of the afternoon. Thetis had come and kept him longer even than usual. Now he was playing my mother's lyre. The music was quiet and bright as the stars over our heads. Next to me, I heard Chiron yawn, settle more deeply onto his folded legs. A moment later, the lyre ceased and Achilles' voice came loud in the darkness. Are you weary, Chiron? I am. Then we will leave you to your rest. He was not usually so quick to go, nor to speak for me, but I was tired myself and did not object. He rose and bade Chiron good night, turning for the cave. I stretched, soaked up a few more moments of firelight, and followed. Inside the cave, Achilles was already in bed, his face damp from a wash at the spring. I washed, too, the water cool across my forehead. He said, You didn't ask me about my mother's visit yet. I said, How is she? She is well. This was the answer he always gave. It was why I sometimes did not ask him. Good. I lifted a handful of water to rinse the soap off my face. We made it from the oil of olives, and it still smelled faintly of them, rich and buttery. Achilles spoke again. She says she cannot see us here. I had not been expecting him to say more. Hm? She cannot see us here. On Pelion. There was something in his voice, a strain. I turned to him. What do you mean? His eyes studied the ceiling. She says, I asked her if she watches us here. His voice was high. She says, she does not. There was a silence in the cave. Silence, but for the sound of the slowly draining water. Oh, I said. I wish to tell you because, uh, he paused. I thought you would wish to know she... He hesitated again. She was not pleased that I asked her. She was not pleased, I repeated. I felt dizzy, my mind turning and turning through his words. She cannot see us. I realized that I was standing half frozen by the water basin, the towel still raised to my chin. I forced myself to put down the cloth, to move to the bed. There was a wildness in me of hope and terror. I pulled back the covers and lay down on bedding already warm from his skin. His eyes were still fixed on the ceiling. Are you pleased with her answer? I said finally. Yes, he said. 
We lay there a moment in that strained and living silence. Usually at night we would tell each other jokes or stories. The ceiling above us was painted with the stars, and if we grew tired of talking, we would point to them. Orion, I would say, following his finger. The Pylades. But tonight there was nothing. I closed my eyes and waited long minutes until I guessed he was asleep. Then I turned to look at him. He was on his side, watching me. I had not heard him turn. I never hear him. He was utterly motionless. That stillness was his alone. I breathed and was aware of the bare stretch of dark pillow between us. He leaned forward. Our mouths opened under each other and the warmth of his sweetened throat poured into mine. I could not think, could not do anything but drink him in, each breath as it came. The soft movement of his lips, it was a miracle. I was trembling, afraid to put him to flight. I did not know what to do, what he would like. I kissed his neck, the span of his chest, and tasted the salt. He seemed to swell beneath my touch, to ripen. He smelled like almonds and earth. He pressed against me, crushing my lips to wine. He went still as I took him in my hand, soft as the delicate velvet of petals. I knew Achilles' golden skin and the curve of his neck, the crooks of his elbows. I knew how pleasure looked on him. Our bodies cupped each other like hands. The blankets had twisted around me. He shucked them from us both. The air over my skin was a shock, and I shivered. He was outlined against the painted stars. Polaris sat on his shoulder. His hand slipped over the quickened rise and fall of my belly's breathing. He stroked me gently, as though smoothing finest cloth, and my hips lifted to his touch. I pulled him to me and trembled and trembled. He was trembling, too. He sounded as though he had been running far and fast. I said his name, I think. It blew through me. I was hollow as a reed hung up for the wind to sound. There was no time that passed but our breaths. I found his hair between my fingers. There was a gathering inside me, a beat of blood against the movement of his hand. His face was pressed against me, but I tried to clutch him closer still. Do not stop, I said. He did not stop. The feeling gathered and gathered till a hoarse cry leapt from my throat and the sharp flowing drove me, arching against him. It was not enough. My hand reached, found the place of his pleasure. His eyes closed. There was a rhythm he liked. I could feel it. The catch of his breath, the yearning. My fingers were ceaseless, following each quickening gasp. His eyelids were the color of the dawn sky, and he smelled like earth after rain. His mouth opened in an inarticulate cry, and we were pressed so close that I felt the spurt of his warmth against me. He shuddered, and we lay still. Slowly, like duskfall, I became aware of my sweat, the dampness of the colors, and the wetness that slid between our bellies. We separated, peeling away from each other, our faces puffy and half-bruised from kisses. The cave smelled hot and sweet, like fruit beneath the sun. Our eyes met, and we did not speak. Fear rose in me, sudden and sharp. This was the moment of truest peril, and I tensed, fearing his regret. He said, I did not think, and stopped. There was nothing in the world I wanted more than to hear what he had not said. What? I asked him. If it is bad, let it be over quickly. I did not think that we would ever... He was hesitating over every word, and I could not blame him. I did not think so either, I said. Are you sorry? The words were quickly out of him, a single breath. I am not, I said. I am not either. There was a silence then, and I did not care about the damp palate or how sweaty I was. His eyes were unwavering, green, flecked with gold. A surety rose in me, lodged in my throat. I will never leave him. I will be this, always, for as long as he will let me. If I had had words to speak such a thing, I would have, but there were none that seemed big enough for it, to hold that swelling truth. As if he had heard me, he reached for my hand. I did not need to look. 
His fingers were etched into my memory, slender and petal-veined, strong and quick and never wrong. Patroclus, he said. He was always better with words than I. The next morning, I woke lightheaded, my body woozy with warmth and ease. After the tenderness had come more passion, we had been slower then and lingering, a dreamy night that stretched on and on. Now, watching him stir beside me, his hand resting on my stomach, damp and curled as a flower at dawn, I was nervous again. I remembered in a rush the little things I had said and done, the noises I had made. I feared that the spell was broken, that the light had crept through the cave's entrance would turn it all to stone. But then he was awake, his lips forming a half-sleepy greeting, and his hand was already reaching for mine. We lay there, like that, until the cave was bright with morning, and Chiron called. We ate and then ran to the river to wash. I savored the miracle of being able to watch him openly, to enjoy the play of dappled light on his limbs, the curving of his back as he dove beneath the water. Later we lay on the river bank, learning the lines of each other's bodies anew, this and this and this. We were like gods at the dawning of the world, and our joy was so bright we could see nothing else but the other. If Chiron noticed a change, he did not speak of it, but I could not help worrying. Do you think he will be angry? We were by the olive grove on the north side of the mountain. The breezes were sweet as here, cool and clean as spring water. I don't think he will. He reached for my collarbone, the line he liked to draw his finger down. But he might. Surely he must know by now. Should we say something? It was not the first time I had wondered this. We had discussed it often, eager with conspiracy. If you like. That is what he had said before. You don't think he will be angry? He paused now, considering. I love this about him. No matter how many times I had asked, he answered me as if it were the first time. I don't know. His eyes met mine. Does it matter? I would not stop. His voice was warm with desire. I felt an answering flush across my skin. But he could tell your father he might be angry. I said it almost desperately. Soon my skin would grow too warm and I would no longer be able to think. So what if he is? The first time he had said something like this, I had been shocked. That his father might be angry and Achilles would still do as he wished. It was something I did not understand, could barely imagine. It was like a drug to hear him say it. I never tired of it. What about your mother? This was the trinity of my fears. Chiron, Peleus, and Thetis. He shrugged. What could she do? Kidnap me? She could kill me. I thought, but I did not say this. The breeze was too sweet and the sun too warm for a thought like that to be spoken. He studied me a moment. Do you care if they're angry? Yes. I would be horrified to find Chiron upset with me. Disapproval had always burrowed deep in me. I could not shake it off as Achilles did, but I would not let it separate us if it came to that. No, I told him. Good. He said. I reached down to stroke the wisps of hair at his temple. He closed his eyes. I watched his face, tipped up to meet the sun. There was a delicacy to his features that sometimes made him look younger than he was. His lips were flushed and full. His eyes opened. Name one hero who was happy. I considered. Heracles went mad and killed his family. Theseus lost his bride and father. Jason's children and new wife were murdered by his old. Bellopron killed the chimera but was crippled by the fall from Pegasus's back. You can't. He was sitting up now, leaning forward. I can't. I know. They never let you be famous and happy. He lifted an eyebrow. I'll tell you a secret. Tell me. I loved it when he was like this. I'm going to be the first. He took my palm and held it to his. Swear it. Why me? Because you're the reason. Swear it. I swear it.
I said, lost in the high color of his cheeks, the flame in his eyes. I swear it, he echoed. We sat like that a moment, hands touching. He grinned. I feel like I could eat the world raw. A trumpet blew somewhere on the slopes beneath us. It was abrupt and ragged, as if sounding and warning. Before I could speak or move, he was on his feet, his dagger out, slapped up from the sheath on his thigh. It was only a hunting knife, but in his hands it would be enough. He stood poised, utterly still, listening with all of his half-god senses. I had a knife, too. Quietly, I reached for it and stood. He had placed himself between me and the sound. I did not know if I should go to him, stand beside him with my own weapon lifted. In the end, I did not. It had been a soldier's trumpet, and battle, as Chiron had so bluntly said, was his gift, not mine. The trumpet sounded again. We heard the swish of underbrush tangled by a pair of feet. One man. Perhaps he was lost. Perhaps in danger. Achilles took a step towards the sound. As if in answer, the trumpet came again. Then a voice bawled up the mountain, Prince Achilles! We froze. Achilles, I'm here for Prince Achilles! Birds burst from the trees, fleeing the clamor. From your father, I whispered. Only a royal herald would have known where to call for us. Achilles nodded, but seemed strangely reluctant to answer. I imagined how hard his pulse would be beating. He had been prepared to kill a moment ago. We are here! I shouted into the cup palms of my hand. The noise stopped for a moment. Where? Can you follow my voice? He could, though poorly. It was some time before he stepped forward into the clearing. His face was scratched, and he had sweated through his palace tunic. He knelt with ill grace, resentfully. Achilles had lowered the knife, though I saw how tightly he still held it. Yes? His voice was cool. Your father summons you. There is urgent business at home. I felt myself go still, as still as Achilles had been a moment before. If I stayed still enough, perhaps we would not have to go. What sort of business? Achilles asked. The man had recovered himself somewhat. He remembered he was speaking to a prince. My lord, your pardon. I do not know all of it. Messengers came to Peleus from Mycenae with news. Your father plans to speak tonight to the people and wishes you to be there. I have horses for you below. There was a moment of silence. Almost, I thought Achilles would decline. But at last he said, Patroclus and I will need to pack our things. On the way back to the cave in Chiron, Achilles and I speculated about the news. Mycenae was far to our south, and its king was Agamemnon, who liked to call himself a lord of men. He was said to have the greatest army of all of our kingdoms. Whatever it is, we'll only be gone for a night or two, Achilles told me. I nodded, grateful to hear him say it. Just a few days. Chiron was waiting for us. I heard the shouts, the centaur said. Achilles and I, knowing him well, recognized the disapproval in his voice. He did not like the peace of the mountain disturbed. My father has summoned me home, Achilles said. Just for tonight. I expect I'll be back soon. I see, Chiron said. He seemed larger than usual, standing there, hooves dull against the bright green grass, his chestnut-colored flanks lit by the sun. I wondered if he'd be lonely without us. I'd never seen him with another centaur. We asked him about them once. His face had grown stiff. Barbarians he said. We gathered our things. I had almost nothing to bring with me, some tunics, a flute. Achilles had only a few possessions more, his clothes and some spearheads he had made, and the statue I had carved for him. We placed them in leather bags and went to say our farewells to Chiron. Achilles, always bolder, embraced the centaur, his arms encircling the place where the horse flank gave way to flesh. The messenger, waiting behind me, shifted. Achilles, Chiron said, You remember when I asked you what you would do when men wanted you to fight? Yes, said Achilles. You should consider your answer, Chiron said. 
A chill went through me, but I did not have time to think on it. Chiron was turning to me. Patroclus, he said, a summons. I walked forward, and he placed his hand, large and warm as the sun, on my head. I breathed in the scent that was his alone, horse and sweat and herbs and forest. His voice was quiet. You do not give things up so easily now as you once did, he said. I did not know what to say to this, so I said, Thank you. A trace of a smile. Be well. Then his hand was gone, leaving my head chilled in his absence. We will be back soon, Achilles said again. Chiron's eyes were dark in the slanting afternoon light. I will look for you, he said. We shouldered our bags and left the cave's clearing. The sun was already past the meridian and the messenger was impatient. We moved quickly down the hill and climbed on the horses that waited for us. A saddle felt strange after so many years on foot, and the horses unnerved me. I half expected them to speak, but of course they could not. I twisted in my seat to look back at Pilion. I hoped that I might be able to see the Rose Quartz Cave, or maybe cheer on himself. But we were too far. I turned to face the road and allowed myself to be led to Pythia.